Thanks for grabbing this Who, What, Why podcast. In San Francisco, I'm Peter B. Collins. Today, an insider view of immigration prisons, the conditions that are often well below most federal and state prisons, and the lack of access to legal counsel and legal advice. Our guest today offers a first-person account of his experience in an ICE prison here in California. The United States government manages a whole network of detention facilities for what are called illegal immigrants. Currently, as many as 400,000 people are locked up in facilities across the country. And it's a patchwork of facilities. Some are privately operated corporate prisons. Some are leased facilities in county jails. And currently, uh, what we are seeing is a cost of uh, significant proportions to lock people up, and they are often not given access to legal services, uh, unable to contact their families. Many times the families don't even know where they are. And presently, Texas, California, Arizona, Georgia, and New Jersey are the top five states with the largest number of people in immigration detention. To learn more, we're going to talk today with a gentleman who has had two tours. Uh, He's had two sentences at uh, facilities here in (laughs) California, the Adelanto Prison, operated by the uh, for-profit GEO Group. Carlos Hidalgo is a 50-year-old gentleman who joins us today. He's now an activist trying to expose what goes on in these immigration prisons, and he's aligned with a group called Civic. Carlos Hidalgo, thanks for being with me today. Thank you for having me, Peter. It's a pleasure being here and giving the chance to expose this atrocity that's being committed right now. So I thank you. Well, centrally, I, I want to talk about language because it's interesting. The GEO Group describes the facility where you were held at Adelanto as a state-of-the-art residential center. And it has <laughs> flat-screen TVs and soccer fields and modern classrooms with up-to-date technology. Uh, but, gosh, you're behind barbed wire. You've got armed guards to make sure you can't leave. And by any any honest, uh, objective look, this is a prison, not some kind of a residential facility. You're absolutely right. Look, of course I'm going to show you what, we, what I personally call the display window. Okay, I... Been in both sides, east and the west side of, of Adelanto Detention Center. And the east side is the old jail that had been there for years. I saw uh, one of the uh, local state prisons that they were using. And then GEO has successfully developed, because of the profit they make off of us immigrants, that that extended to the West Wing. Now, the West Wing is made out of a state-of-the-art detention facility, supposedly. But what makes it a prison is because they used prison tactics to run this facility. Now, although there are a lot of uh, commodities such as <clears throat> electrical doors, you know, you don't use the keys like in the old prisons. Uh, yes, they have big screen TVs in the center dorms when you are, you know, uh, the game room areas, you know, where they give you access to play and, you know, uh, congregate, we you know, with the rest of the guys there, but It doesn't change the fact that the system is a prison system. That in the end, you end up in a cell. You're surrounded by barbed wire, like you said. And the structure that is built around the way they run it is all prison tactics. Mm -hmm. From the way the guards talk to you, from the way they line you up to go to chow, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, all prison tactics. You know, one of the uh, main things that you hear from the guards telling you is that they want to know that you're nothing. So they tell you, they don't pay me enough to give a shit about you, and that is strictly like something they really live by because, mm-hmm. you know, they want to make sure that you are submissive to what they want you to do to have less problems. And when you're there already broken down half, you know, half the time that you're there, you don't have no way how you're going to get out, what's going to happen because they have you indefinitely Right. Morally, you're already destroyed. And then them telling you and crushing you further down, it just brings you down to your knees. Most people, as you already know, have been noted that it's been uh, committed suicide 
attempted to commit suicide. Mm-hmm. And then six inexplicably deaths in the facility they were supposed to be cared for as detainees had already happened. So we still have no answers on that. So, Carlos, uh, I, as I understand it, you really think it's important to use the right language here. And I agree, because uh, these detention facilities with over 400,000 people locked up across the country are off the radar of virtually every American. They have no idea these facilities exist. They only know that when ICE conducts a raid, people disappear. (laughs) And uh, this is a very critical issue to me because I believe that the constitutional standards and the uh, uh, obligation to avoid detention that is cruel and unusual um, are frequently violated uh, with impunity. There, There is no accountability for the wrongdoing that occurs in these facilities. That's very true. And let me tell you how I can attest to this 110%. When I arrived in the United States on January 10th, uh, 1981, I was only 11 years old. And we were caught at the border. Immediately, we, I'm coming from, I'm from the Salvador. So we were coming at a time where our country was, you know, in, at the worst of, uh, of its um, violence. Yes. So once we got here, we immediately invoked, you know, political asylum. And <clears throat> to me, what I'm about to describe to you was one of the biggest moments of me being in America and knowing that what, what America was all about. And the moment that we got detained, my mother, it was my mother, myself, my younger brother, uh, and my younger sister that was two years old. And my brother was five, and I was 11. And we invoked uh, political asylum, and immediately the officer, the DHA, Department of Homeland Security back then, had this green overall suit on him. And I remember this man, blonde, tall, with a big receding line, you know, red face, been in the sun all day. His big green eyes reaches to me and puts his hand on my shoulder and he tells me, Muy bueno, muy bueno, muchacho. Bus just started behind. Bus just started behind. And that heavy accent, talking to me in Spanish and patting me on the shoulder and giving me that look, to me, was like, that, that was my Captain America. Hmm. You know, and I get emotional because what I'm about to tell you is it's the two sides. Of the story here. It made me feel protected. It made me feel that I had arrived to the place where I can fulfill my dreams. Because I don't want to hear bullets whizzing by my ears anymore. I don't want to see my nephews or my uncles being slaughtered and shot and tortured and found them dead the next morning. I don't want to see that anymore at the age of 11. In my country, at the age of 9, I was forced to shoot and kill a man, self defense, at the age of 9. My childhood was gone. So here I am in a place where now I can fulfill my dreams of being something. Now think about that. And this man made me feel that immediately when he did that. He, one gesture, embrace, uh, made me feel like a whole country embraced me. One gesture, one person made me feel that way. Now, I, having gone through all this that I've been through in the last five years, it makes me feel like I'm a criminal. It made, it had made me feel like... I don't belong here. Like everything I've done in this country, I was a successful real estate agent. I have three children born here. I have a grandson. I pay my dues, my taxes. And now the system who has now built around this immigration issue that we are now living has made me feel like I'm a nobody. I have nothing to <laughs> have nothing to give. Mm. It didn't take in everything from me, everything I've earned, even the right to see my children, because while in detention, I was not allowed to answer to my complaints in family court, so I lost the custody of my children. You know, my business, my financial security, my stability, everything I worked for all these years, taken away on a system that is so crooked and corrupt right now, because us immigrants are now the highest, the biggest commodity in business, private industries that create these detention centers, quote-unquote, are nothing but money-making machines. Well, no. and, and we know that the contracts that are written with the corporate prison operators guarantee them payment for a certain number of beds every day of the year. 
And so there is this incentive to fill them up and to keep them filled. That's correct. I mean, imagine that. They're putting now numbers guaranteed. That means no matter what, we're going to get to see, but we're going to keep them indoors. There's a gentleman friend of my name, Sylvester, who recently we did a big event, had been detained for nine years. Peter, imagine yourself being incarcerated nine years without having committed a crime. We haven't violated any laws other than the fact that you don't have a stable status in the United States. Does it take nine years to develop a status in the United States or grant your visa or tell you, okay, you're being deported? Mm-hmm. Instead, they shuffle you around. And for nine years, you're in limbo in this system that is profiting every day from you. And, Oscar, we have a known backlog of uh, cases in the immigration courts, and the judges are overwhelmed with caseloads in the thousands. Uh, and, and most recently, there was a decision that came out of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals here in San Francisco, and that's supposed to be the most liberal, dangerous, liberal court in the country. And they ruled against the interests of teenage children, saying that the government is not required to provide an attorney for them in deportation hearings before immigration judges. Yes. And the claim was made by the judge, the justice who, who wrote the decision that, well, the immigration judge can advocate for the interests of this child. And the statistics presented showed that when a lawyer represented uh, a a minor before the immigration courts, 46 percent of the time uh, there was a resolution in favor of the child. And when no lawyer was present, the uh, resolution in favor of the child was only 10 percent. And and so these these are very clear black and white figures that uh, demonstrate the the barbarity of the dungeons that we have created with profiteering right on top of it all. Exactly. What I, I'm trying to go back in time and figure out when did this all change? When did this country become so predatory towards immigrants? When did this country change the compassionate heart that it always had, that this is the land of your dreams, you can fulfill all your dreams and, 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 and fulfill your pursuit of happiness. When did that all change? This country used to stand for something. Well, I have one answer for you. In 1996, President Bill Clinton signed the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, which doubled the number of people in immigration detention. In just a two-year period, it increased from 8,500 to 16,000 by 1998. And if you go way back, uh, you know, to the 1970s, we, at that point, only had a handful of people being held for immigration issues on, uh, on any given day. And the proceedings were different, too. They all had a deadline, a time limit. Now it's indefinitely. Immigration has now changed to a point that they have given ICE such power that they call them discretionary rules. So that means that each individual in, on, uh, off, uh, ICE officer has the power to grant you release, bond, by making an assessment based on their own discretionary rules that they are to detain you if you have committed an aggravated felony. But because we are not under the spotlight. We're not under the scope. We, it's a group that's not being watched or it's not being monitored. They're taking everybody. Whether you have an aggravated felony, a misdemeanor, it doesn't matter. You're an immigrant, you're gone, you're going. Another thing is, because of that rule, what you read earlier about a mandatory amount of individuals that need to be in detention, well, since when and where is it written that it has to be a mandatory six months detention? Is it no law, no, no law in immigration law has written that says that once you detain, you have to be maintained mandatory six months in this detention center for GEO. What that's doing is guaranteeing these people a certain amount of dollars for individuals every six months. Once that comes, there's something called the Rodriguez bond hearing, where now you're playing the numbers game. How many will be released under bond? And their bonds given in immigration, some are 
speaker bonds than they are given in criminal courts, which is ridiculous because the people who are now being detained in these immigration centers, quote unquote, are now being convicted for crimes they have already paid for, meaning in the judicial system, they already did their time for the DUI or any other conviction they might have been convicted of. It's already done and paid for. On the eyes of immigration, no, now you were convicted of a crime, now you must come here and do six months again, and you'll be held in detention. That's double jeopardy. I see it very clearly as double jeopardy. And now it's just another loophole they have to keep you to make that money. Because if you don't find yourself in that loophole of uh, committing a felony, they have something else that is called crimes of moral turpitude. And every crime is a crime of moral turpitude, even if it's urinating on the street. It's immoral. So they're going to charge you for that. So therefore, they're going to hold you. And guess what? Six months. So they have made this loophole to no matter which way you go or how you're being detained or for whatever reason they're keeping you, they're going to hold you there for six months. If you're lucky to afford an attorney, you'll be having representation when you go to court that will give you a chance in six months to get a bond. Now, if you don't get a bond, then the deportation procedures will continue. That, But this waiting line, it, it could take years. Why is that the issue here? Why not just immediately make an assessment, allow you to have voluntary deportation, if you can pay your own ticket and fly back to your country? That option is not given. You mandatory have to stay six months. And it aggravates me because I haven't been there. I see the atrocities they do. This facility has no ability to maintain that many people detained at any given time. People that have dialysis have to be moved every other day from 4 in the morning to a different location to get dialysis. Being brought at 11 o'clock at night. No extra meals, no protein meals. I see them almost dragging their feet, shackled hand and foot, back into the dorms. This, you're talking a lot of people of age here. Dialysis drains the life out of you. How can these people have the heart to see that and do that? And they don't even have the facilities to provide that service within the in, in-house. Mm-hmm. People that are diabetic, they don't have extra meals, protein meals that continue to give them the energy they need. And Carlos, and, Carlos, I understand that you organized a hunger strike at one point, and they put you yeah. in solitary confinement. Tell us about that. Well, <clears throat> when I arrived, I, the first time around, they, I got myself to be known by geo officers because I was helping everybody to get their paperwork done and vacate their convictions so they can get a better chance once they saw the immigration judge. Well, when they, I was released the first time around on a $10,000 bond, within a year's time, under the same conviction, they were like, I don't know, following me, whatever you have, but I have committed no crime. They found me again, and they take me again for the second time. And this time, they are getting more bold because now they are doing this roundups just to compensate for the people that are being released. So I decided that this time to make a change here. But not just a one change, a, I mean a lifetime change. Let them know this cannot be happening. So I slowly started to communicate with the groups, of different ethnic groups within the detention center, and we orchestrated a hunger strike. Now, all so we can have a fair a fair chance to survive in that place. We were asking our demands for better medical, okay, meals, uh, the uh, living conditions, which is, you know, better housing, clothing, uh, yard, what they call the silly yard, soccer fields. They are in the middle of the desert. They're going to put AstroTurf. And let me tell you how state of the art this is. They give you shoes that when you walk and you've stepped on the AstroTurf, it is so hot, not only you cannot even use the AstroTurf, your shoes literally melt the soles of your shoes. And I'm telling you that because that happened to me. Wow. I am literally melted in the grass, the AstroTurf, that my shoes went right through it. So when we did this, it was because we needed to have at least a little better environment to at least be able to survive day to day. Okay? The, the, the way they treat you, the way they make you feel, the meals are so poorly in taste and so small. You know, you're hungry all the time. In one occasion, 
they gave us ground turkey meat. The minute the trace arrived to the dorm and we lined up, we started feeling the smell. And when I saw that first trade, because I, w- I used to run the dorms and serve the food after as the cart, I noticed the meat itself, you know, was moving. There were maggots in the food, Ooh. in the meat. And this is like something so obvious. The sergeant tells me there's nothing there. Serve it, you eat it. I said, no, you eat it, take one spoonful of this, and then I'll eat the rest. Only if you take the first bite. And he couldn't make it close to the trade. I mean, that's how careless they are. I mean, how can, how can you be so heartless? You're going to give us food with maggots in it. You know? So when all these atrocities are being committed, we had decided to take a stand. 840 some detainees at the time decided to do this. Okay? So once they found out that I was the one that orchestrated this, they came after me with the intentions that they were going to take me to the uh, doctor, but I knew that was not the case because I had no, made no medical call. So they took me out from my dorm, and they put me in solitary confinement. Uh, my attorney, my civil rights attorney, Christina Fiala from Civic, they kept calling. My daughter was calling, and they could not locate me. My number was off, and they don't know if I had been transferred, what had happened to me. And in the end, they ended up transferring me to Theo Lacey in Orange County. And my transfer documents read, to be transferred to Theo Lacey, uh, consider a danger to the safety and the security of this facility. And I was transferred. Immediately, well, eight days after detention, they transferred me to Mm Lacey. Now, let me ask you about violence in the prison and the extent to which the guards really operate without any constraints. Uh, Because if if you get beat up by a guard in an ICE detention center, who do you call? Who do you report it to? Let me tell you, that's happened quite often. The thing is that Solitary confinement, it's solitary confinement, which you would think that is a place that will be more monitored because you are in solitary and, you know, you will have more tight up security. But those are the blind spots that when you're in there, you're fair game. So the guards have a way of making sure that you are in those blind spots. So, yes, there are times that there's, the guards have, I personally know for the fact that one of the uh, individuals who passed away in the detention center was taken by the guards for supposedly a stomach cancer, but I, I knew the guy, and the guy had no stomach cancer. Taken to solitary confinement on Friday, pronounced dead on Tuesday, and he was in solitary confinement. One of the guards, coincidentally, now that had had the shift that night, happened to have bruises and, and, and scratches and bandages. You know, it's just very clear that they have... The premeditation, they, they think it, it's premeditated for them to take you to blind spots, make sure the security is not, you know, anywhere in sight for them to do what they do to you, regulate you, put you in a spot of fear so you won't do that again. Mm-hmm. That is a practice that they, it, it, practice, it happens all the time. And when it comes to the opposite side of, of what you should be doing, detention centers providing safety to the detainees, Okay. Because remember earlier when I said about the Captain America individual who welcomed me here? Right. Well, that's not the case now, okay? Because now I don't have to worry. That, I'm sorry, then I didn't have to worry about being hurt. I felt secure. I felt protected. Now the very same people, even ICE officers, okay, had done on the outside when they detain you some violent, aggressive violence acts against immigrants. We are treated now immediately like we are the criminals, like we are someone that's such a threat that they have to make us submissive immediately and put us in fear and, and use violence to, to, to do us so we can, you know, obey to what they say. And it's not like that. Why would they do such violence? Why should they use such, such aggressive, you know, uh, tactics to something that is very simple? We are people just like everybody else with a different status. We are hardworking individuals that we want to pursue a chance to succeed in our lives for our families. But in their eyes, we're not. So we are treated in a way that we are less, I would say, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That we are less of, uh, of a person to have the chance to be given to succeed. You know, and that really aggravates me because I grew up in an era where you were given a chance to succeed. And it's great. 
to achieve that and be accomplished, feel itself of, of accomplishment. Nowadays, all we're doing is the very same way of life that the United States have always said, you know, the, the stability of family. They are the very same ones that are taking it away. You know, you take your mom and dad out of the equation, breaking homes. Now you have a broken home where a kid will straight to drugs or gangs or be the next wave of crime that they're going to generate in the future because the stability of home is gone. Finan- you know, the stability of financial stability is no longer there. Mm-hmm. You know, so they have to look for other ways to to survive, and that becomes, you know, stealing, selling drugs. It escalates. Mm-hmm. I know a family who lived very well before the husband was brought into the detention. Now, they lived in a garage, and now there's only the mother and the daughter because at 14 they killed their son because they got involved with drugs and the gangs when the, son, when the father was in detention for two years. Mm-hmm. So those kind of atrocities, it, it not, only, not only affect us immigrants in a, in individually, but as a whole in, in uh, communities. I understand. It, it hit. And, and Carlos, uh, when fights break out between prisoners at Adelanto, what do the guards do? Let me start by telling you this. The guards are not prepared to handle a one-on-one fight. These guards, at best, at best, I will say, they are security guards. Their, their tactics, you know, are based on the tactics of, of a prison. But for them to put into practice are very, very unlikely to be able to use them. So these if these are the these guard, these yes. are these are mall cops who aren't even as well trained as a state prison guard. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, they'd be like if if, if anyone wanted to overpower this detention centers of the land for example, that I've been there, they will have no problem. They have one guard inside the dorm. Watching, and basically, he's not a guard. I would say, but then he's the gopher because he's the gopher for this, go for that. You need toilet paper, he'll get it for you. You need this, he'll get it for you. You know, so if they want to overpower this, they could do that at any point in time. They have no, you know, self-defense skills. If they want to jump in and protect a, a guard that's being beaten by, no, uh, I'm sorry, a detainee that's being beaten by another detainee, which has happened many other times, because you have a mixture of immigrants that are now being sent from upstate for coming from prison to be housed in a detention, quote-unquote, detention facility who houses individuals that come off the streets that never committed crimes other than private DUI or uh, failure to appear. And now they're in the mix of individuals who have done heavy crimes. Mm-hmm. And they have a certain system that the jails and the prisons are run. So they have to control. When you don't want to adhere to that, to that system, you get regulated. And that regulation becomes very popular as the days go by because you don't know how to fit in, You're, and they have to show you who the boss is. So when it comes to people that have never been in jail before, yeah, you know they're going to get there as be because they're not adhering to a certain rule. If you are homosexual, well, it's only obvious people have homophobia, especially coming from upstate, but they're going to get theirs in one way or the other. Okay, they have HIV individuals mixed in the crowd, general population. Well, people get worried and concerned, and that ignorance, not to insult them, but the ignorance of not knowing how HIV is contracted, puts them in fear. Mm-hmm. What does fear do? Adheres to violence. So what happens? You know, anything can happen in there when that, when that uh, happens because accidents will happen, and they don't know how to prevent that. You officers have no training whatsoever. If you ask, if you were the chance to ask them how long the training is, I would say the last time I heard there was a uh, they were held in uh, groups and they were done on a one week at a time. So they send a group for a week, get trained, go to work because the need of guards is such a high demand that they don't have enough time to train them. Mm-hmm. So now let me terrible. ask about this, Carlos, because I interviewed a, a guard from an Arizona ICE prison a couple of years ago. And it had a female population. And there were serious problems with uh, guards who were trading sex for favorable treatment of women, whether it was phone calls or access to an attorney. Uh, And again, this occurred without any uh, kind of accountability 
uh, when women reported, uh, you know, pressure to give sex for favors. Yeah, that's very true. That happened in Adelanto. Uh, some of the female guards, for some reason, they felt attracted to this long-term uh, guys that were coming from upstate. And yeah, they, it was noted, and it's on record, that some people got fired for doing favors and having sexual uh, contact with the uh, detainees. They would put money on their books. Uh, I know for once, um, one of the guys who I was with, I come from upstate, was having sexual intercourse with one of the uh, female guards in the uh, storage room. You know, every time she was on shift, that would happen. A few days later, money in his books. He had money all the time. So it, it happens quite often, you know, and also in other facilities where I know other people that I've spoken to throughout the years that are transgenders or homosexuals. They're put in situations where by the same detainees, they are being forced to have sex. And the guards, knowingly, okay, they are completely, they completely ignore the incident, okay? So in one, you know, in one hand, they could do something about it or not, choose not to get involved. So it happens. They choose rather not get involved and make it happen. And then themselves, too, they're getting involved with the detainee. You know, it's something that it's very, very regular. Believe it or not, it's very regular that it happens out there because, you know, they feel in a position of power. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and what about drugs? How easy is it to get drugs at an ICE detention facility? Very easy. I was completely, I'm glad you asked that question. Not to say that everybody there is a drug user, but because you have mixtures of people coming from prison, all habits are hard to break. So in prison, you still have that problem in prison where the, tactic, where the practices of, of detention and security are very high. Now, you come to a security facility like Adelanto where they practice the same tactics at a poor level, but nonetheless prison tactics. The ability to bring drugs... It's unbelievable. During visits, you know, if they practice, they can bring drugs easily. Okay? And it is sad to say, I just being fair, I know all the spectrums that it happens. And yes, they do, ha- they do bring drugs in, you know. And they, it moves the circle of, of business within the uh, facility. Mm-hmm. So, and, and what about if somebody's smoking weed, it, it's kind of hard to uh, disguise the smell. Uh, so do guards just, uh, you know, smell it and ignore it? Or uh, do people get disciplined when they're caught using marijuana, for example? I personally, smoking weed, never heard anybody make any issues of it. They go in the shower, steam up the room, you can still smell it. But what am I going to do here? Go in and tell these guys to stop smoking? So do the guy, and, and you're talking guys with prison experience. To a guard that just came off the street and wants to go home and plays his Xbox, you know, what is he going to do? I'm going to finish my shift and go home. So they let it be. They let it run. Mm-hmm. They have no choice. Now, Carlos, uh, my final area of questioning is about the access to legal counsel and to legal information, a law library. Because, uh, as we've noted, many people are sent there with a flat six-month sentence. And they often lose contact with uh, a lawyer they may have had back at home. Uh, and uh, they're really just left on their own. So uh, what is the uh, quality of access to uh, legal information and legal counsel when you're in an ICE jail? Look, when I got there, I noticed in the first five days, all these violations committed against us immigrants. We had no access to legal books, only pamphlets given, pamphlets being chosen by eyes. So immediately I called a friend, I have an attorney from the outside, so he sent me all the forms to vacate a, a criminal case. <clears throat> I set up shop. My way to keep busy and not deal with my own situation was help everybody out. So I did that. So here we are vacating cases because we have no legal counsel that can give you any information. They have groups that come and give you what's called Esperanza, hope in Spanish. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, 
and they give you a certain amount of information that you can take with you. But they don't actually put hands on to recommend you to someone that's going to represent you. And there's a list of attorneys that they give you that if, if, you, if you had it right now, I would read it to you. All the attorneys that are there, they're not nonprofit. They're, of course, you know, you got to pay. But it's not the adequate information you would want to get immediate help to stop your deportation. You know, and it's a high-end pay attorney. So in there, to, in order for you to defend yourself, to have some kind of information, you don't have it. If anything, they make it difficult for you because when they found out that I was doing what I was doing, they went into my dorm, to my cell, and distributed from every document, and then to every other detainee that had it, they took every document that had to do with criminal, court, criminal courts. They sent me to, uh, to uh, isolation for a whole month, okay, to solitary confinement for having done that. When I came out, immediately I appealed it. I filed agreements. I had to discuss this with ICE and the warden of the detention center. It took me three weeks to make the point that the laws of the United States do not stop at the walls of Adelanto. We have a right to at least protect ourselves and defend ourselves. And they gave me the chance to get those papers back. But because I was given a chance to do so, that meant that people were going to be active on their documents and get cleared for any criminal conviction they had in the past. They had to figure out a way to stop us. So what they do, they allowed us to have only three copies per page of every document that we had to do. So the package is 12 pages to vacate your case back then. We could only get three per page. It would only give you one hour of library to do that. And straight out they told me, we don't give you more than three pages because it costs us too much on paper. Now you have three, two, three, four convictions. How long is it going to take you to have this taken care of and sent to the criminal justice system to be vacated? It'll take you weeks, days, weeks, months. We cannot afford it. Every day that goes by is a day that people that I know, Peter, were sent out and deported because of these people's balls to the same, no, you cannot get another copy. No, you cannot send that out today. You have to withhold tomorrow because, you know, you, you only get your three copies for the day. It summed up to that, to one piece of paper for you to gain your freedom. And these people had the audacity to tell you, no, you cannot do it. And it angers me because, you know what? That's too much power for someone to have to destroy your life. I get it with mine. I am barely picking out the pieces after four years of being in detention. And I'm doing this, and I'm dedicated to this immigration work because there's no other way for me to pay them back and get back at them or to expose them for what they are. Okay? How can that right be taken away from us to be happy, to be free in this country? Since this birth has been set up by immigrants, built by immigrants, and still run by immigrants, and people forget that. We are people that have rights to succeed in this life. We are people that have the rights to grow old, old and, and, and have children and be happy. And we are treated like we're less, we're less than anything but human. Yeah. Well, Carlos, I really appreciate you sharing these experiences with our listeners. I think most people will be shocked to learn what is going on. And I hope that uh, your work with the nonprofit activist group Civic uh, will help expose uh, this series of dungeons. Uh, that's, I think, the yes. best way to describe what we have set up here. And people uh, uh, lose a lot of their rights and, as you pointed out, are clearly treated as less than human. Yes. And this is not only immoral and a violation of legal and constitutional rights, it's just fundamentally un-American. And I would like to apologize to you on behalf of, uh, of thinking, feeling Americans who do not want to be associated with uh, this really ugly, uh, inhumane uh, treatment of human beings. Peter, I thank you for the chance. And if I say one more time, one more thing, it's just, we, I'm just a story, Peter. I'm one of the many thousands that have gone through some probably worse but you guys are the vessel in your ways of media and communication. And I thank you for giving me the chance to put it out because people need to know that this, at this day and age, to be happening is unthinkable. This should not be happening. People's lives should not be destroyed at will of the government. 
it'd be much easier to have some kind of a arrangement, amnesty, or something that can work, that we can be productive and not be chased after. But as I said, you guys being the, the vessel of this, I thank you for allowing me to put it out there and, you know, making people aware that at least by opening somebody's eyes, they can have the contact of someone that can make an impact and make a change, a movement that can change this forever, not just for now, but a permanent change. Yeah. Carlos Hidalgo, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this podcast from whowhatwhy.org. I always appreciate your feedback and comments. Drop me an email, peter at peterbcollins.com. And if you're in a position to do so, we'd appreciate your financial support here at Who, What, Why.